Good afternoon and welcome to Dowling High School. I'm Mike Schaefer, a social studies teacher. We have a program here at Dowling where the seniors are required to volunteer a certain number of hours to the candidate of their choice. This year, seniors have volunteered more than a total of 10,000 hours. Today, we have with us one of those candidates, Senator George McGovern, and here to introduce him is Senior Heidi Schmeling. George McGovern was born in a small town in South Dakota in 1922. The son of a former coal miner turned minister, McGovern was educated in South Dakota's public schools. In college, he excelled in debate, winning numerous awards for Dakota Wesleyan University. World War II interrupted McGovern's education in 1943. He piloted 35 combat missions over Nazi Germany, some under heavy fire. Because of his leadership in battle, McGovern was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. After the war, he used the GI Bill to attend Northwestern University, later receiving his PhD in government and history. After working for several years as a college professor, McGovern decided to put his ideas into action by becoming the head of the South Dakota's Democratic Party. And by 1956, he was elected to the first of two terms in the United States House of Representatives. In 1960, John F. Kennedy asked McGovern to be the first director of the Food for Peace program. McGovern's efforts provided food for the hungry and aided the stability of third world nations. At the same time, he drastically increased commercial markets for American agricultural products. Two years later, McGovern ended almost 30 years of Republican control of South Dakota's U.S. Senate seats. And during the next 18 years, Senator McGovern served on various committees such as the Senate Agricultural Committee, the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee, and was the chair of the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. McGovern's commitment to the grassroots democracy and fair play led his involvement led to his involvement in efforts to open up the Democratic Party to all Americans. The McGovern reforms greatly increased the importance of events such as the Iowa caucuses, thus making the Democratic Party more responsive to its membership, such as, such as making it easier for 18-year-olds and women to be delegates in national conventions. The Vietnam War's senseless waste of our nation's young men and resources convinced McGovern to run for presidency in 1972. He warned of the problems and the tremendous costs that the war would bring to our country. McGovern won the nomination, but despite, despite tremendous odds against him, but lost in the general election to Richard Nixon. In less than two years, Nixon was forced to resign because of crimes committed in his campaign against McGovern. In 1974, McGovern was elected to his last term. He continued to oppose military excessiveness, such as the B-1 bomber. In addition, he served twice as a delegate to the United Nations, and in 1981, he formed Americans for Common Sense to counter the growing strength of white right-wing extremists. McGovern, his programs, and the kind of open government he stands for inspired millions of previously uninvolved Americans in 1972. And with our help and determination, he can do it again in 1984. I'm proud to present Senator George McGovern. Many, many thanks, Heidi uh, Smelling, for that wonderful build-up. I hope I don't do anything to blow it. Uh, is there anybody else here at this school for George McGovern? You got a few? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> we've got uh, eight good men running for the Democratic uh, 
presidential uh, nomination, and I'm running on a 10-point uh, program that I think I can lay out for you here this afternoon in less than 10 minutes, and then whatever time we have left, you'll have an opportunity to throw some questions at me. If I were President of the United States, one of the first things I would do is end our military operations in Central America. I've been watching with uh, growing concern the uh, argument of the Reagan people that all of the problems in Central America are caused by the Russians or by the Cubans or both. I believe that even if all Russians and all Cubans were to disappear this afternoon before this assembly is over, we would still have revolutions going on in Central America. And the reason is that hundreds of thousands of people in those little countries to the south of us are desperately unhappy with the kind of government that has been exploiting them. For example, in El Salvador, the Catholic bishops have reported that in the last few years that government in El Salvador has killed 30,000 innocent people, including four Catholic American women who've been working there as social workers, three nuns and a Catholic lay worker. They assassinated the uh, Archbishop, Oscar Romero's, after he made a public plea to the government and its related death squads to quit killing uh, their own people, this is not the kind of government that deserves a billion dollars in American military equipment. And I think we're playing into the hands of the communists in El Salvador by wrapping our arms around that unpopular, corrupt, uh, and unjust government. We'd, we'd accomplish a lot more if we would address the problems that are causing these revolutions. One of those problems is hunger. And we have, uh, uh, in this country, especially here in the state of Iowa, surplus uh, agricultural production we don't, what, don't know what to do with. We've been paying our farmers uh, not to produce. How much smarter it would be, and more humane, and more uh, constructive, if instead of sending arms, trying to prop up a government that caused these revolutions in the first place, we would address uh, the problems of hunger and disease in El Salvador by sharing uh, some of the food that we have in such abundance here in the United States. So I'm not writing off Central America. It is an area where we have interests, but we ought to deal with those interests by common sense diplomacy and a humane uh, constructive use of our economic uh, resources, our food, our medicine, uh, and our know-how if we want to win the respect and confidence of people in that part of the world. The second step uh, I would take if I were President of the United States, and I would do it this afternoon, would be to order our Marines out of Lebanon uh, not to please me or not to enhance my standing, but to save their lives, put them on the ships, and bring those ships back to the United States. This is not a partisan judgment. That's exactly the same recommendation that Senator Barry Goldwater, a leading Republican, a former Republican presidential contender, has made when he said that we ought to take everybody in American uniform, get them out of Lebanon today, and, uh, and bring them home. If that recommendation, which I've been making for many months, had been followed, 264 marvelous young men who are now dead, members of the Marine Corps, uh, would have been removed uh, and brought back safe and sound uh, to the United States. Even after telling us uh, a few days ago that, the, that he was going to do this, that he was going to put the Marines on the ships offshore, the Marines still remained in this vulnerable position. I heard on the news yesterday morning that hostile forces have surrounded them within 200 yards. That's like across this schoolyard. The enemy guns facing these badly outnumbered Marines. And one has to ask, what for? What is it, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Lobbing 16-inch shells from the battleship New Jersey against the Druze and the Muslims of Lebanon. 
Is there anyone in this auditorium today that has any quarrel with the Druze living in Lebanon? What is the conflict that we have that justifies killing these Muslims in uh, Lebanon, in a country where they represent a majority uh, of the people? Do they not have the right to uh, protest and revolt against a government that they feel uh, does not serve their interests? Who appointed us to sacrifice the lives of young Americans trying to weigh in on the side of a government that represents perhaps 15% of the people of Lebanon and has little or no apparent support from the other 85%. Why do you suppose the government of Lebanon that's supposed to be loyal to, to President Jamal is surrendering and defecting to the other side? Is it our obligation to try to straighten out this incredibly complicated and long time uh, difference among the uh, people of that little country. The third step that I would take would be to invoke a freeze against the further construction of any nuclear weapons of any kind. Everyone here, no matter how young or how old, knows that if we didn't produce one single additional warhead, we have the capacity, if we just use 10 percent of the present nuclear arsenal, to destroy every living thing in the Soviet Union. They could do it to us, too. Each country lives because of the uh, restraint on the other side in unleashing this final war. But what is to be served in terms of our own security, piling up these additional warheads at the rate of three or four a day, which is now going on in both the Soviet Union and the United States? Somebody has to break that cycle. And I believe if the next president would order a halt to it, we would not jeopardize our security uh, in the slightest. If the Soviets want to continue this nonsense to their own economic bankruptcy, they do not weaken us. They're weakening only their own posture and the support of their own people. In any event, while pressing for a verifiable mutual freeze between the two countries, we ought in any event to have the common sense to stop right now, adding to this surplus overkill that contributes nothing to the security of any American. I believe if we would take that step and then try to tighten up on the procurement of other weapons to develop a more efficient way of operating our national defense, that we could save somewhere in the range of 20 uh, to 25 percent on what we're now spending on the military. That would release the kind of money we need for other things that are important to the real strength and security of this country. And my fourth step would be to put people back to work doing things that would be useful and increase the prosperity and strength of our country. One thing, for example, we need in the United States is a modern system of rail transport and public transit facilities in our cities. We talk about being number one, and in some respects the United States is, but certainly not in railways, certainly not in public transportation facilities, but to make a commitment to give this country the best rail service that exists anywhere in the world by the end of this century would be a marvelous way to put hundreds of thousands of people back to work doing something uh, that is useful. If the MX missile's going to cost us $50 billion, and it probably will, with a similar cost to the B-1 bomber, I believe with all my heart that spending that hundred billions of dollars giving this country the world's best railway system would contribute vastly more to the defense and the security and the well-being of the American people and it would provide infinitely more jobs. Spending money on sophisticated military systems is the poorest way in the world to provide jobs. In the first place, it doesn't provide very many jobs and it's in an area that does not contribute much to the security and strength of our, our country. Fifth, we need to look at the uh, problems of the American farmer. Now, I know that most of the people in this room probably live in the city of Des Moines. Uh, you're not acquainted firsthand with the uh, problems of agriculture, but those who are, those of you who have grown up on the farms, you know that people both in the cities and on the farms have a vital interest 
in preserving our family farm type agriculture. It doesn't make any difference whether you're in Brooklyn or Chicago or Los Angeles or out here on an Iowa farm, preserving that soil that sustains life and that enables us to talk about the United States as the bread basket of the world, that's a vital interest to everybody, at least everybody who eats. It's a vital interest to everyone that covets uh, a secure uh, future. We used to worry about the oil supply. It's even more important to worry about the source of our food, especially at a time when population growth all over the world is placing new uh, pressures on the available sources of land. Right here in Iowa, we're losing that precious topsoil that sustains life. We're losing it at the rate of 10 tons per acre every year. Uh, I know a hundred years seems like a long time to somebody who's only 16 years old. It's not all that long. A hundred years ago, the topsoil here in Iowa was twice as thick as it is today. At that rate, a hundred years in the future, we won't be the breadbasket of the world anymore. We'll be a barren wilderness, unable to sustain the growth of grain and edible oils and dairy products and livestock and other things that makes American agriculture the envy of the world. So we need to do two things in agriculture. We need to address the income problem of the farmers first, or they're all going to go broke. You won't have either farmers or land. And that calls for a decent uh, parity program that I would set somewhere around the 90% level. Then it calls for a strong uh, soil conservation program to stop the loss of our soil, of our land. We need a grain reserve. If it's important to have a petroleum reserve, it's important to have a food reserve. And then, as I said earlier, we need to expand the use of our surplus production uh, to feed the hungry in our own country. There's no excuse for any American to be hungry, certainly not in the state of Iowa, one of the most productive food producing areas of the world. And we could do more with our food surpluses overseas than we're now doing. I think uh, Iowa corn meal and wheat and edible oils and dairy products properly used in an area like El Salvador or Nicaragua or Guatemala or other parts of the world would do more to dry up the swamplands of hunger in which communism breeds than all of this expensive military hardware we're shipping to these poor countries around the world. We also need an agreement among our uh, uh, grain exporting countries to get together and set a fair price on grain exports so that they're not uh, undercutting each other. And finally, we need a multi-year uh, farm program so that farmers can plan ahead. The way it is now, we have a grain embargo one year. Then the surpluses pile up, and so we have a PIC program to pay farmers $12 billion the next year not to, not to produce. Then the third year we have nothing, and the fourth year we guess what's coming. That is not the way to operate a common sense uh, farm program. The sixth step I would take is to do something about a tax system that is permitting the wealthiest people in this country and the wealthiest corporations to avoid taxes that are then dumped on the backs of middle class uh, working families. It's not fair. It's adding to this enormous deficit uh, that many economists think uh, is, is, a, is a time bomb uh, over our economy. And it's unjust to those who are, who are paying their, their fair share. That has to be corrected. Seventh. A student loan program for all students who are qualified who want to continue their education at a higher level. If we're worried about the repayment of those loans, about the, uh, the person who takes a loan, gets a job, and then doesn't pay off his or her loan, there's a quick cure for that, and that's to run the collection of student loans through the Internal Revenue Service. You folks are not old enough to know an awful lot about the IRS, but I can tell you one thing they do real well is to collect money. They're, they're the best money collectors in the country. You wouldn't have any defaults 
on student loans if the collection responsibility were run automatically through the IRS so that when you get a job after you graduate from Iowa State or Grinnell or wherever it is, uh, and you get a job, automatically a certain amount of that salary is going to be taken by your em employer and turned over to the uh, IRS. The, uh, uh, the uh, eighth uh, step I've already mentioned, which is the, uh, uh, the one to utilize our, our agricultural abundance more effectively than we, than we have abroad. Ninth would be to relieve the states, the federal government relieve the states of the burden of welfare. The federal government's carrying most of that burden anyway. Assume the rest of it so we can have a more or less uniform uh, public assistance program across the country with the understanding that the states would spend what they're now spending on welfare for uh, elementary and secondary education. Finally, uh, equal rights for all Americans now, especially that majority of Americans who happen to be women. Well, that's the McGovern uh, program. I probably left something out of the 10 points, but I'll take care of that when I get to the White House. Thank you very much for listening to me today. We've got about uh, 19 or 20 minutes now for questions from you, so if you'll raise a hand, I'll recognize you on anything you want to interrogate me on. Yes? Uh, when elected president, will you abolish registration for the draft? If I'm elected president, will I abolish registration for the draft? I couldn't do it by executive order, but I'd ask the Congress to do it. I don't think we need either a draft or registration for the draft, and I'd try to get rid of it. Uh, what happens if you get a Congress that's not willing to work with you? Is there anything that you could do to uh, get your laws passed? Well, this is a wonderful question because when uh, uh, a candidate for the presidency talks, as I did here today, about the need for tax reform, for example, you're talking about something that's within the jurisdiction of the Congress, and it's very tough. The special interests who want to leave that tax law just the way it is and preserve all of those loopholes is well organized and very powerful. I would think, just to be candid with you, that uh, a president who commits himself, say, to closing 80% uh, of the tax loopholes would be lucky to close 30 or 40% of them because of the lobbying power against you, but at least we'd be moving in the right direction. On the issue of tuition tax credits. I'm opposed to tuition tax credits. I believe in private schools like Dowling uh, High School, but I think it ought to be funded privately, not by the federal government. What's your uh, views on abortion nowadays? Well, I'm opposed to uh, abortion personally, but uh, while I'm not pro-abortion, I'm pro-choice. I think this is a, a matter that uh, the individual has to resolve on grounds of conscience, and I would enforce the Supreme Court decision if I were President of the United States. What's your stand on the death penalty? I'm opposed to it. How do you feel about the PAC programs, and do you think they're just trying to buy, buy votes? Well, I think we've created a political threat in these political action committees. Uh, and uh, primarily because they're so heavily uh, dominated by corporate uh, groups with an axe to grind. There are some political action committees that I think are serving the public interest, those that are working in the environmental field or on support for education or matters of that kind. But uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that at least two out of three of the PACs are designed to strengthen the uh, interests of corporate America, which is not always the public interest. They're raising enormous amounts of money to contribute to candidates who uh, uh, would like to uh, enhance the, the uh, use the tax laws to en enhance the well-being of the wealthy at the expense of the ordinary American. They're trying to get out from under regulations that are in the public interest. And I think that uh, we probably made a great mistake when we created these PACs in the first place. 
I hope someday we'll have the public financing of campaigns, not only for the presidency, but for the members of the Congress. I think it would be a great break for the American public. How do you feel about the deployment of missiles in Western Europe? Well, I wish we had held off on that. Uh, for a while. We, uh, we actually only made negotiating efforts over a period of about two years. We made an agreement in 1979 to do it unless something could be worked out uh, by 1983, but we really didn't start the negotiations until 81, and then they were hit or miss, haphazard. I think we should have held off for another year or two attempting to see if we couldn't negotiate some kind of a deal with the uh, Russians that would have made that unnecessary. The Russians have indicated at various times that they would be willing to bring down the number of SS-20s to not more than the number of French and British missiles that are in Western Europe. If they would really go with that kind of a deal, I'd grab it and not put any more uh, missiles in on the uh, Western side. You seem to be in favor of a heavier burden on the federal government. Um, do you think that would raise? On the welfare. Okay. Do you think that would raise the deficit or taxes? And are you concerned with higher deficit or more taxes? Well, the amount of increase that I've talked about here today on the federal government, you may be thinking about the transfer of state welfare to uh, federalizing that program, would be about twenty billion dollars. But also here this afternoon, I've talked about knocking out systems like the MX and the B-1, which are very heavy burdens on the federal taxpayer and on the federal government. I read in uh, Fortune magazine here yesterday that uh, by the end of 1985, if President Reagan should be reelected and he gets everything he wants on the military side, he will have virtually doubled the size of the military budget. That is an enormous increase of federal cost and uh, federal responsibility uh, that goes beyond anything I've proposed in terms of uh, federal spending. I would say flat out to you that uh, I can't conceive of a McGovern administration or any of these other uh, seven Democratic contenders ever permitting the federal deficit to go to 200 billion a year, which is where it is now under this present administration. With all of his talk about conservatism, which we would usually equate with caution in government spending. Uh, President Reagan is far and away the biggest deficit spender in all the history of the United States. If he, uh, if he were to serve another term and go on the way he has, he would have added as much to the national debt as all the other presidents combined in American history. So uh, while I might worry you a little bit about some of the things I've proposed here today, rebuilding the railways, uh, student loans, I didn't even mention one of my programs, which is a 10% mortgage loan on a one-time uh, basis. Those things cost a lot of money, but the kind of things I'm proposing would stimulate jobs, they would enrich the lives of people through education, housing, the environment, transportation, and so on. I believe the government would collect much more in the form of revenues from the greater productivity of the people we're helping. So it's not really a shift of major power to the federal government. It's a shift away from the Pentagon to areas of federal responsibility that I think would do more for the American public. Yes. Would you support a United Nations force to replace the multinational force in Lebanon? And if not, in what capacity do you feel the United States should be involved in the Lebanese conflict? Would I support a UN force to replace the U.S. Uh, force and the other multinational uh, troops that are there? Yes, I would. I wish we had started that way. I think it's a mistake in the Middle East, which is a very explosive area, to put in troops in a peacekeeping role uh, from either one of the superpowers. Uh, it's probably a mistake even to draw soldiers from a country like France, which has had a long uh, imperial connection in uh, the Middle East. It would be better to draw the so soldiers from more or less neutral countries like Sweden or uh, Ireland, uh, Austria, Australia, India, and so on. And that's something the United Nations can do. 
I was pleased to see that the uh, Soviet government has said that uh, it would not uh, object to a UN force going in there. They wouldn't use their veto, uh, provided the American forces uh, would get out of Lebanon and pull the ships back from their immediate proximity to Lebanon. How do you feel about your performance and the other Democratic candidates' performances at the forum at the Civic Center last week? I gave myself first uh, in that uh, debate. <clears throat> uh, more, more importantly, what did you think? I'm a Republican, so I didn't go. <laughs> oh, I see. I thought maybe you saw it on television here. I was looking for an objective assessment from a Republican here. Uh, uh. <clears throat> you mentioned in one of your points that you want to subsidize, like, send grain to um, third world nations. Yes. Who would subsidize the farmers for this, and what would this do to our future market? The farmers would be paid for it. What you're talking about, if you had a 90% uh, price support loan of the kind I talked about, and I know this is a very complicated thing, but if you guaranteed farmers 90% of parity, that would have the effect of raising present farm prices substantially. Some of that grain would come into the uh, government reserves, into the Commodity Credit Corporation, just as it has under past programs, and that grain would have been purchased from the farmers, either under a loan arrangement or outright purchase, and the government would then be free to use a certain percentage of that grain that they had bought from farmers for humanitarian purposes. I might tell you, for a year and a half, I ran that program during the Kennedy administration, the so-called Food for Peace program. Are you familiar with that? It's a, it's a program under which we use surplus grain or dairy products, edible oils and so on. We can either sell it on a concessional basis for um, the currencies of other countries when, they're in, when they don't have dollars uh, and hard currencies, or we can give it to them outright. And um, we're, we're under a biblical command to do that. The, the whole Judeo-Christian tradition calls on us to feed the hungry. We have no other choice morally except to respond to the needs of hungry people. We learn that in the church, uh, whether we're Protestants, Catholics, or Jews. That's a deep part of our uh, moral tradition. But I would argue that it's even wise foreign policy. Because, as I said here earlier, if communism, in fact, finds a seedbed in hunger, which it does, there are very few people who are well-fed and well-governed who uh, embrace communism voluntarily or embrace any other kind of authoritarian doctrine. It's usually desperately hungry, misgoverned people like the kind in El Salvador or Nicaragua or Cuba under Batista. Those are the kinds of people who reach out in desperation for some kind of an authoritarian fix. And uh, I think our food and our medical know-how can help counter uh, problems of that kind that otherwise erupt in, uh, in revolution and sometimes communist uh, uh, revolutions. I'm trying to see if anybody clear up here in the back has a hand. It's a little hard for me to see against the uh, the light, just way up here at the top. Bill, your uh, landslide loss 12 years ago will affect your chances of getting the nomination. Uh, no, I don't think so. The question was, do I think the landslide loss 12 years ago will uh, affect, I assume adversely, my chances of winning the nomination this time? It's true that I lost very heavily to Richard Nixon in 1972, but how many people are now happy about that? Uh, the, uh, every, uh, every poll that I saw a year after the election was over, and we knew then about all the scandals in the uh, Nixon administration, the only president in our history ever forced to resign in disgrace, uh, every poll that I saw showed that if the election were held over, I would have won. So I'm going to try to find out whether those people are telling the pollsters what they really believe. I'm going to give them another chance in, uh, in 1984. We'll find out in the Iowa caucuses next uh, Monday whether people have really gotten religion 
and uh, whether they understand the great loss they suffered in 1972 uh, by not making me president. How would you handle gun control? I'm for gun control on the handguns. I uh, despise and hate these little snub-nosed uh, handguns that are killing policemen and killing people in their families, holding up stores and all the other things. I know that the National Rifle Association says that guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, you can say that about anything that's uh, dangerous, but why invite uh, the danger of unnecessary death by uh, throwing a handgun at everybody that wants to shoot. I think that they ought to be under tighter regulation. I would not, as a practical matter, recommend any additional controls on sporting uh, guns, on the rifles and shotguns, the kind of thing we use for wildlife and hunting uh, out in this part of the country. But the handguns are a different matter. They ought to be put under tight control. Yes. You stated earlier that there was no reason for the United States to be in the Middle East, um, and then you said... No reason to be there militarily. <laughs> okay. No. No, I don't, I don't want to cut you off. Uh, go ahead, finish the question here. But... <laughs> you said that you wanted neutral countries from the UN. You wanted neutral countries yeah. to fight there, and right. I was wondering the difference there you made. Yeah, I don't want the, uh, uh, if I, the question was, uh, I, uh, the, the young, young man said that I didn't want the United States in the Middle East, but I do favor uh, soldiers from uh, neutral countries coming there to fight. I don't want anybody to go there to fight. I would hope that the UN forces that have been in the uh, Middle East before and never had to fight would not have to fight next time. I think the reason our forces were assailed uh, were not because they were evil uh, or because of anything they did wrong, but because they were Americans in a very explosive part of the world where that part of the world is, uh, uh, is at least in part inflamed against us. I suppose one of the reasons that the uh, Muslims and the, particularly the terrorist elements out there is, are as angry as they are at the United States is because they think we're too prejudiced in favor of the state of Israel, which they see as the real problem in the Middle East. I don't see it as the real problem, but I think a great many uh, Arab political figures, and especially the more emotional, emotional ones, are against the United States uh, because of our support for the state of Israel. That's why it's better to get somebody that's more or less neutral on this Arab-Israeli dispute. Uh, and some of these smaller countries are in that vein. I don't think they'd have to fight. I think if the UN were out there, it would be respected as an international body. It wouldn't serve as the kind of a lightning rod that forces, say, from France uh, or the United States do. It's probably not a, an accident that uh, the Italians uh, uh, who have forces out there now have not been hit uh, by these attack groups. Nobody's mad at Italy. Uh, in the Middle East, and their forces uh, have been unmolested and unchallenged. Yes, this young woman right here. About the drinking age. About the drinking age? Well, <clears throat> I guess I'm more worried about people, uh, people's judgment than I am about their age on uh, drinking. I think alcoholism <coughs> Uh, comes very close uh, to being the number one social problem in the country now. It's blighted so many people's lives, including some people very close to me, uh, and I worry about the lack of understanding and uh, education on that issue, not only of alcoholism, but on other forms of drugs. And alcohol is a drug, make no mistake about that. Uh, it's, a, it's a dangerous product. Maybe if we had more understanding, education about the dangers and about the hazards, uh, the drinking age wouldn't be as crucial as it is. I think the movement to raise the drinking age is based at that point. There's a presumption that younger people may not fully measure the uh, hazards involved in becoming addicted uh, to drugs of any kind, whether it's alcohol or, or something else. I'm not sure that simply raising the drinking age would solve the problem. It probably would mean there are more closet drinkers, more people getting it on the sly, 
and in the back seats and the back alleys and that sort of thing, but whether or not it would deal with the problem, I'm not sure. In any event, this is ordinarily thought of as a state issue, and I've got so many headaches just dealing with the federal issues that uh, maybe I ought to leave that one alone. How's our time, Mike? The... We have time for one or two more questions. <laughs> okay, right, clear back here. <laughs> If I got the nomination, who would I choose as my running mate? Well, uh, I'm not really sure uh, about this. This, usually, this question usually comes, would you select a woman? I certainly wouldn't rule that out. I think uh, uh, women are uh, admirably qualified, either for the presidency uh, or the vice presidency. I suppose the only pledge I could make to you here today is that I'd try to find someone uh, without regard to color or sex or anything of that kind that I thought uh, was compatible with my views and that, that I could serve with uh, and that would be well qualified to take over if anything happened to me. I would really try to make the judgment uh, on that basis. I had some trouble on that choice last time, so I'd be very careful about it this time. Would toward Russia? What, my feelings about detente towards Russia? Well, I thought that was one of the best things that my old nemesis, uh, Richard Nixon, did, was to try to work out a spirit of detente with the Soviet Union. With all of his faults, uh, he was pretty good on his relationships with uh, the major communist powers, China, where he opened up relations for the first time, and the Soviet Union, where he was able to get the SALT I treaty signed and ratified by the United States Senate right in the middle of the Vietnam War. I always thought that took some doing. But he did believe, and still does to this day, in regular communications with the Soviet Union. That is frankly why I went to see him here a few weeks ago. I wanted to underscore the fact that notwithstanding our bitter rivalry over Vietnam, and over Watergate and other matters that on the issue of relations with the other superpower that we both understood the importance of regular uh, systematic uh, dialogue uh, between the, the heads of state of these two great superpowers. So I would try to restore either what um, President Nixon called detente or what former President uh, Eisenhower referred to as peaceful coexistence. Maybe an even better phrase than those is peaceful competition. Uh, we have two different systems of government, an economic organization, two different philosophies. But uh, I don't think we have to kill each other in order to demonstrate those differences. We ought to carry on the competition peacefully because the alternative is, is death uh, for all of us. The real question now that we have to face with the Soviet Union in the nuclear age is uh, an ancient question uh, to be or not to be. That's really the, that's really the ultimate question in 1984.